<laughs> we'll find that. Boy. Do we want, do we want up or down on the mics? Okay, everybody, let's get started. So welcome to the first budget year 2015 City of Issaquah budget meeting. Um, we're starting this meeting. Uh, uh, Council members Goodman, March, Cher, and Milligan are here. Council members Polly and Barber are on their way. They are still in, they're in executive session at the Eastside Fire and Rescue Board meeting. So I've been contacted, uh, I've been made aware of that. I do expect them to attend. Uh, and so I do believe we have an, we have an agenda, that's wonderful. Uh, and, and really we've scheduled a good chunk of time tonight and um, I don't think we, well we're just gonna get right into it, but really it's all about the general fund. We're gonna start with a big picture overview. I'm getting some nods here. Uh, and so, who's going to start, Bob? Okay, so, so let me just say before we get started, you know, um, you know, we're, you know, we're we're starting off great, right? We we've got a process. I know you guys have been working on this for a while, uh, and and really now, you know, it, it becomes a real collaborative effort. Uh, I know that this council is very familiar with our. Um, what we've done in the last few years. They're very familiar with our policies, uh, financial policies, and you'll probably hear me mention our financial policies more than once. Uh, I ask for forgiveness ahead of time, but really, you know, I believe it's a key part of this being a, a real successful effort and doing it in an efficient way that we keep our, you know, those are our guiding documents. And I know that between um, you know what what the work plan priorities were for uh, the you know for staff going into this including our own goals and including those uh, financial policies those are the key guidelines that uh, the administration had in putting together uh, you know this prepared budget so you know that's the basis that we all share and I think um, I'll be looking in listening and also talking in my own self trying to keep that in mind and 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 just and, and as a way and as a tool to kind of keep us on track and keep us focused on the right kinds of issues and making sure that we're policy based so i just wanted to say that and you know thanks it's a it's a i've scanned through the document it looks really good it, it really does and i can't wait till our futures online systems where these are not just static pie charts on you know, but we can interact with the data and, and look at different graphs and charts. I know that's in the future, but you know, the presentation is, is really got a good start. I'm looking forward to, you know, for through tonight and, and everything that we have already scheduled, I think a total of four and a fifth if needed uh, budget meeting. Yes, yes. it's, yeah. yeah, we've got three that are definitely, we're gonna be getting down and dirty and a fourth if needed and or we'll probably need the fourth. It's just this, it's a complex, and I know this council likes to get things right. Uh, so um, anyway, so that's it. Just want to say those few words. Thanks for being here. Let's, Diane, over to you. Okay. Um, well, this kind of start off, we're starting really big picture. I think one of the things, you know, having been in this business a while, it's really interesting because each year it becomes more and more difficult to develop a budget because our resources are either declining or becoming more and more restrictive. And so when we're building our budgets, we need to look at different funding and sources coming together in order to accomplish perhaps one particular project. Additionally, as you'll see in our presentation, we're proposing some new revenue options to help fund some increases that were outside of the city's control, but also as a way of continuing to maintain our level of service. Um, about this time every year, you begin to see newspaper articles about other cities nationwide and even in the Northwest. And what I have been seeing is that some of the, what you'll see tonight, you'll. Um, what I want to share with you is some of the challenges that we have both in this budget and long term and we're not unique. Um, I was sharing with Bob, I was looking at one newspaper article where they were adding some jobs and I'm like, wow, how are they adding jobs? That was the headline. 
but when you got into the story of the article, they were creating a new fee in which they were doing a hydrant tax per residential house, and that was how it was paying for all of these new additions. So, you know, whether you're up in Snohomish County or Northern King County or in Pierce County, and you're seeing a lot of the cities when they're beginning to present their budget, both offering up, recommending revenue um, increases or new fees, as well as they've also done some reductions, which we'll be talking about later on tonight. So um, one of the things is you sort of just do a temperature test to see how do we compare to other communities, and the articles that I'm beginning to see in the papers is much similar as to what I was seeing here. So starting out with the um, first slide is, you know, the city of Issaquah, we're a business, and we're a big business. Once we get going. So um, the city of Issaquah is a corporation and our annual operating budget is a little over 118 million. So, you know, when you think of the corporate world, we're a very large business. We provide lots of service. We have a lot of diversity in the services that we provide. Um, this is up substantially from last year. It's up about $10 million. It's primarily up as a result of a number of capital projects, both in our utility operations as well as our street operations. So that is the, the most significant increase. When you look at our overall $118 million, you can see that the majority is spent in two major areas. The first area is our general fund, which accounts for around 33%. And the remaining portion is our utility. We have about 24% in our utility capital projects and utility operations. And then we have about 20% in our streets. So as you can see, the three primary um, operations we do is our utilities, our streets, and then our general fund. Looking at it a different way, and this is the first time we've done something like this, is we try to look at how we functionally spend our money. And um, when you look at this slide, you can see that of the entire 118 million, 14% uh, is related to public safety, 21% is related to transportation, utilities at 22, and then uh, parks and rec recreation would be our largest at th the next um, largest at 13%. So you can, it's a different way of looking at it from a fund structure versus um, an operational. So like transportation, when you look at that, we actually have money related street operations, some money in our capital improvement fund, our, uh, some money in our 355 fund, we have some money in our ITS. So what we try to do is to say, okay, this is a different picture for you to understand how we spend our money. Um, and as you can see, you know, and then our utilities includes both our capital operations and our operating. So that includes both. Um, so it's just a different way of seeing how we spend money. So when we developed our budget strategy, these were some of the philosophies or the approach that we were taking. We wanted to continue to maintain our sound financial management practices, and that goes to Council Member Winterstein's comments about our financial policies and ensuring that we were adhering to those policies that the Council adopted in 2013. Uh, we also wanted to look and review and major uh, review and address our major cost drivers. Several years ago, in particular, it was our health care. It was going up anywhere between six to eight percent. You know, we're pleased to announce this year that our we have a zero percent increase in our health care. So that was a major primary cost driver that by going self insured we were able to get a little more control on those costs. 
Um, we want to develop a long-term vision and to direct the city's activities and resources to what the community wants. And in that light, we are in the process of developing a community survey that we will be sending out to the community to get their input on a variety of topics. And then uh, we'll be coming back to you once the survey is complete to give you the results, to give you an idea of how the community was responding. We looked at different revenue options, looked at which of those seemed to be the most palatable or those that would be work the best. Um, and then we, want to, we wanted to maintain services that create a vital and livable community. The, um, you'll see that we were able to continue to fund our services at their current level and we did not have to do any major reduction as far as level of service in the programs that we provide to the community. And then we want to continue to implement best practices. We've shared with the council over time that we've been training our organization in, uh, in the philosophy of a high performance organization as well as lean processes that deals with efficiencies and finding ways to improve our processes, deliver services in a more efficient manner. And then we want to develop those metrics as we develop those practices to see, compare them against what our measures are to ensure that we're tr achieving those goals or if not, what things can we do to make a correction to that so we can stay on course. The budget summary um, for 2015, um, it's balanced you know, with revenues and expenditures. I think the most important thing is we had a lot of conversation last year about some of our operating funds. So our operating funds are not reliant up upon any um, previous year's beginning cash balance. There is some small exceptions. There was a project. Um, the Historical Society had funded a feasibility study this year. They were not able to complete it, so we took both the dollar and the programs and moved them forward to 2015 to accomplish that. You'll see we're using a lot of our cash balance to complete a lot of capital projects. Um, this is probably one of the largest capital projects years I have seen. Uh, looking back in the history of City of Issaquah, we have a very aggressive program that we want to accomplish next year. And then in many cases, we'll be having some conversation. We have included some carryover of projects when we have known what those projects are. Some t there's two philosophies. Um, if it's known and we have enough information, we'll go ahead and rebudget it. Otherwise, sometimes when we get into March of April of 2015, we'll come forward to the council with an amendment. So where it was known or we thought we had reliable information, we went ahead and budgeted those projects that were carryovers. The revenue adjustments and enhancements are um, in three funds the general fund, the sustainability fund, and the sewer, and we'll be talking about those throughout the three days that we're doing the workshops. And it includes some strategic re reductions and enhancements. We did an aquatics reorganization, which is a division of the Parks and Rec program. Uh, and then we also did a small reorg in the parks facility, and then we increased human services funding over previous years. So I just, on the last slide. Yeah. So the main thing I wanted to say is uh, part of this was the task that the council gave to the mayor last year. And, and the mayor uh, you know, says at times he gave it to himself since he was council president yeah. last year. But uh, it was very important to him to make sure that the, the budget was balanced this year, both on revenues and expenditures. And as we go through some of the detail, you'll see that there's a combination of both some revenue enhancements and, and cuts. And I think... Um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to communicate, and you heard that from him Monday night, that he was he was very serious about uh, accomplishing that this year, and he took a uh, he's taken a pretty substantial um, investment on both sides to try and accomplish this in the upcoming year. So as we go through um, the overall budget, I think you'll see that there's a there's a, a balance that we were trying to strike of both uh, revenues and expenditures uh, reductions that ended up in the budget this year. Tag team this. Yeah, we do. <laughs>
So some of the highlights in the proposed budget is in the general fund, we have included the 1% allowance in increases in property tax. This amounts to 75000 As the mayor indicated in his presentation, it's around $4.19 increase annually for a house that's assessed at around 420000 it also incl includes an increase in the B&O tax. We'll be spending considerable time on uh, last year as part of the council president's message. The administration was asked to perform an in-depth analysis and study of our business and occupation tax structure and then come back with some re recommendations. An ad hoc committee was formed and Bob will be sharing with you the results of that, um, the work that the committee did as well as some work done at the administrative level. Currently we have a surcharge, it's an eGov surcharge and it is a pass through to eGov Alliance. Um, we're proposing establishing a technology fee and there'll be some conversation about that also tonight and explaining it. It was part of your agenda packet this last Monday night and I think it got referred to committee, no, it got referred to here. Oh, got referred to here and then um, there's a recommendation to establish a non-city resident park and recreation fee to help cover some of the costs of the programs that we currently provide funding from either property tax or sales tax. As I indicated earlier in sustainability, also in your packet from Monday night, there is a recommendation to increase the contract fee with our solid waste services so that we can continue to provide funding for our Office of Sustainability and the valuable programs that they provide. We'll be talking about that program um, next Tuesday night. In the stormwater fund, um, the operation part, it's pretty much status quo. There really isn't any um, significant changes from pro la this current year. The last rate increase was in 2008 for the stormwater. We continue to fund our capital projects with existing rate revenue, and uh, the fund ha currently has no debt outstanding, which is um, very nice. For the sewer utility, the last rate increase for the city portion because the sewer bill is broken out to a city portion which is a, the smaller portion of the overall revenue and then the larger portion is a pass-through fee for Metro for the collection and transmission of the sewer. Um, Metro rate is recurrent, Metro is having a rate increase of 4.5 percent for single-family residential sewer rates and a 3.9% for multifamily. And I believe that was also included in your agenda packet for Monday night. Um, and then again, the capital projects are funded with through the rate revenue structure versus the existence of any outstanding debt. For the water utility, the last rate increase was in 2011. Um, capital projects there are also funded with rate revenue and we have one outstanding bond currently in that fund and it, it was issued in 2001 and it should uh, be paid off in 2021. It's around $600,000 a year. Some additional changes is in staffing. We have a court security officer. We are recommending that that position convert from a part-time non-regular position to a regular part-time position with benefits. Um, the municipal court in working with them has had a difficult time recruiting for this position and in comments with the people that we've been interviewing they've said if it comes with some benefits and they have a greater probability of finding a suitable candidate for that position. This particular change does not require any additional increase. They had sufficient resources within their operating budget to absorb this change, but it's um, when we change from a part-time position to a regular budget position, then that's a long-term commitment. So that's the distinguishment of uh, a part-time non-regular and a regular part-time. So we're also recommending a position, a limited duration period, 
that would be a senior accountant project position to assist with the implementation of the ERP system. We imagine that should go around, uh, take about two years to do the full implementation, and that person would be e both doing some backing up in the departments, in the finance department, as well as working on the overall implementation. We, in the administrative assistant position, we have done a 1.5 reduction. We've eliminated, and that is in the general fund. We've eliminated the recreation supervisor position. We reclassify the aquatics coordinator to a recreation coordinator. Um, and the rest of that sentence, I don't, I, it doesn't belong. <laughs> so, and then we eliminated the city arborist horticulturist position. We also eliminated one recreation leader position and we added two recreational aid positions. So overall in our aquatics division, we have a overall one FTE budget reduction there. And then we have a very small increase in environmental science assistant. We're gonna increase that position an additional 0.15 to a 0.75. That's in the storm utility. We have a lot of requirements in that fund as a result of the NPDES. Council goals. So, um, so for the council goals, we were able to fund the the requests that came through when we did our retreat. So under safe drug free community in the general fund, we have appropriations of 70,000. We have 40,000 for police overtime, 10,000 for parks overtime and 20,000 for outreach. Affordable workforce housing, there was no funding needed at this particular time. We wanted to get a report card first to see what direction the council wanted to go. And once we get that general information, then we can develop a further, refine the plan and figure out where we want to go. Um, the Central Issaquah Anchor Project, in the adoption of the council goal, it was between zero to $10,000. That $10,000 was for potentially for a re real estate a consultant to provide some assistance. But until we really knew what the scoping of the project was and the real need, we did not fund it at this time until we cut, knew where we were going with that particular project. Enhance Old Town Vitality. Um, the funding for that is in the Capital Improvement Special Project Fund. We have appropriations of 20000 for the Shell Gas Station project that would be managed by DIA. And then we have 75000 for the start of the Mobility Master Plan. The 75000 is the easy part. Once we get through um, this, the developing the study, the further work is around a half a million dollars that we would be looking to fund in 2016. And then uh, the council recently did a review of our existing 2013 and 14 goals that we're still working on. And the only one that really required any additional appropriation was $35,000 for a marketing package for the city of Issaquah. And that's in the capital improvement fund. Can I just say one thing about that right here? I, I, that over the course of the year, we've, we're always using a, a different label for this and um, I think the what we just approved it was specifically for to perform a sector analysis no. oh look I got a no and a yes well I think <laughs> currently in 2014 we have funding for a sector analysis mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but this is for 2015 to develop So this is not that sector no. analysis thing that we no. just funded it okay. is a different project yeah and I thank you yeah, I think it was presented in a way that there were several steps to get to this final end. And um, so the agenda bill related to the final materials and information that would feed into the final packet. And uh, admitting I'm the new kid on the block. So in the 2015 goals, when uh, the enhanced Old Town Vitality, when the goal was made, it did not have a specific project. 
and uh, now it has funding and a project. Is the project already decided, and, and how did that? How does that part come together? I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, actually, it was presented to Services and Safety last week. Oh, uh, yeah, the, yeah. So, um, and so it's it's included in the area under the uh, nonprofit funding. But the justification is this, this particular council goal. So they do have a specific project, and we do have a packet on that. Um, okay. That it's act, yeah, it's in the services and safety packet from last week. You can see that. And that was the council review. Of yes, that's project. we look at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Astola. So, so I was lucky enough to um, sit in on services. I guess I didn't realize when we when uh, Dia discussed that particular project that it was uh, within the context of um, being a, a partial satisfaction of this council goal I thought it was just part of them showing us why they wanted uh, uh, to to get a uh, to be on the budget and I guess I would have asked a lot more questions regarding how this was going to help meet this goal if I had known that um, that that was the, the purpose of it it was not uh, it was not communicated um, that, that that's why they were doing it. So, um, yeah, thanks for admitting that. Uh, you were not alone and not recalling that there was a specific line item in our goal, uh, but I did go back and take a look on it, and it's spot on exactly what we approved uh, in as far as our 2015 goals as, as this capital, uh, as a, a capital project for uh, Old Town Vitality. Oh no, I, 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 I knew that. I remember I was one of the authors of the of the of, of yeah. there were several people who submitted goals on yeah. in, in not seeing it last Thursday that the connection was there, that's right. right. So this is riveting so far. Please continue. <laughs> uh, was that question satisfactorily answered? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, moving on. You're just flipping. So um, let's dig, dig right into it. Um, in the general fund, here is the proposed 2015 um, revenue sources for the general fund. And then we've also provided you with some historical comparison. Uh, for 2015, property taxes in particular are a little over $7.7 .7 uh, It says it's a 5% increase. What it is is it's a 1% increase over last year but we received about 150000 in new construction dollars this year. So a lot of the projects, particularly the ones up in the Highlands, they were finished up in late 2013, and they missed the cutoff for the property tax rolls. So all of those projects came on in 2014, and then we'll collect the taxes for those in 2015. So, um, at the county level, what they do is any project that is not substantially completed by July 31st is not included in their uh, property tax assessment rolls. So we work with them trying to get you know them to review and inspect any of our buildings that we think that are far enough along, along so that we can get as much into the tax rolls. Um, in the in our budget document, the 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 numbers go back to 2013, and it's great that you have 2011 and 2012 up here. So, um, if 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 this electronic copy could be made available, I'd appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, sales tax, as you will see, is pretty flat, and that begins our first challenge when we were developing the budget in that we normally have seen some substantial increases in our sales tax and we're just simply not seeing them at this point in time through 2014 so we are only increasing them slightly over what we had anticipated for 2014 Currently, for 2014, we're running behind the 8.6 million that we had estimated, not by much, but, but around 150,000. So, um, I we backed off that forecast and that revenue estimate. Um, you'll see in other taxes, you'll see a 21 percent. Uh, the majority of that is um, the proposal for the B and O tax, and then. 
Um, the other larger category is charges for services. You'll see an increase from 5.7 million to 6.4 million. Other taxes equals BNL? No, there's a variety. There is a business and occupation tax in that category. There are all of our utility business and occupation tax, so that's gas, electric, telephone, cable TV, um, a very small percentage that we collect on the water utility. It also includes small dollars for gambling tax, leasehold excise tax. So it's, it's a t category of primarily business and occupation type taxes. On charges for other services, a good percentage of this increase is related to the Department of De Development Services Department. What they do is they do expedited review. So this is a, a, an in and an out. The increase is a little over a, a million dollars, so it's a million dollars in revenue. And on the other hand, we have an additional million dollars in expenditures because that is money that those projects are being um, reviewed by third party. So the developer pays us for the work that the third party does. So we're just budgeting that revenue. Typically, you'll see we're proposing a budget amendment here for the October 20th meeting, and you'll see where we have included the expedited reviews because that number has become substantial compared to previous years. And other than that, there really isn't any other significant changes in our revenue stream. It's pretty consistent. We're seeing some small increases in our jail service. We've been seeing some increases in the number of beds that are being occupied by people outside of the city. So that revenue is increasing around 100000 But I think primarily because our main revenue sources are property taxes and sales tax and other taxes, the fact that we have a flat uh, projection for 2015 makes it really difficult when we were trying to balance the budget. Uh, Diane, I have another question. Uh, uh, remind me if there are a change that we can see in that chart in sales tax revenue distribution that impacted how much sales tax we get in these recent years. I, I can't re keep track of all. <coughs> So you, are you asking the categories? No, uh, how sales tax is distributed in the state. Oh, um, sales tax the, of the 9.5% that a consumer pays, the city of Issaquah receives 0.85 in sales tax. So the 6.5% goes to the state. Some money goes to the county. Some money goes to... Um, metro Transit. There's actually a breakdown in the budget that shows you the sales tax distribution. So we s receive a very small percentage of the overall sales tax collection. I'll come back to that Go. later. I have another thought. I'll come back later. Thank you. Okay. One um, part of my opening remarks was sort of reflecting back, you know, in 2007 when we, we began to get the early indication that we were heading into a recession, um, people started beginning to cut back. And then we got into 2009 and the 10, and we, the city did um, some, st some st substantial layoffs during that period of time. And then we kind of roll forward to 2015, and even with those reductions that we made and the ones we're proposing, we're still struggling to balance our budget. And I started reflecting back because I've been in this business a long time, and a lot of it really started in the late 1999 and into 2000, and a lot of it was as a result of voter initiatives. That was the beginning when government began to struggle. Um, the first one was the repeal of the standing motor vehicle excise tax. Back in 1999, the city was receiving around 150,000. Uh, probably in today's term, that might be closer to four or 500,000. So that was a, a revenue source that had been around for years that we then made, made an adjustment, continued to provide this, our level of service. 
The next one was when Initiative 747 came into place in 2001, and that had the most substantial impact. Um, traditionally, governments were allowed to increase their property taxes by at least the, up to 6%. Um, and then the, an then the state legislators enacted a limitation of 1%. And um, I will tell you, historically in the past, the property taxes is what paid for the incremental increase in governmental services in the general fund. At that time, the finance people all sort of started saying the sky is going to fall, the sky is going to fall, the sky is going to fall. And I think it's just taken a very, very long time because we started employing other measures to continue to provide services. Everybody became dependent on sales tax. Let's get business in. Let's get tourists in. And then the Internet world started up where we're starting to see a decline in our sales tax because we're seeing greater usage of Internet. And there's still a lot of transactions that... Um, we are not collecting sales tax on. So that was another area where we made an adjustment and it's just taking its time to get here. Then we had Initiative 776 um, that repealed the $15 local option vehicle excise tax. In 2002, the street fund was receiving 120000 So that was another loss of revenue. Then in 2008, we had streamlined sales tax. Um, the state was... It was really nice because the local governments that were severely impacted negotiated with the state of Washington to get a backfill for some of that revenue loss that we saw when we changed from point of sale to a point of delivery on our, our transactions. That was my question. When did that happen? 2008. Um, so we have been fortunate enough to receive 800000 Now that 800000 has been fairly constant since 2008. Uh, a couple years ago we saw a 3.4% reduction. So when you start looking at this, this all starts, you know, you can sort of see this little storm brewing where, you know, we, we are, we're losing revenue on this one hand and we're looking at trying to do more development, bring in other resources vis-a-vis -vis sales tax. And then the last one was the liquor, liquor, liquor state shared revenue distributions. <clears throat> we lost some revenue in 2011. We, in 2011, we received 145000 And in 2013, we received 42000 So you can see that we have been making these course corrections for, well, almost 15 years and we keep sort of fixing things and fixing things and fixing things. Fortunately, we've never really reached a crisis. Um, and we, so now we're still continuing to look at other options to continue to provide services. So I appreciate that. This is actually very informative, uh, a look back like that. I don't think I've seen it presented this way. Uh, so uh, from your perspective, I appreciate that. I want to make sure I understand the streamline, the, the 2008 change. Because mm -hmm. in the other bullets, you kind of talk about what we used to receive and, and or what we lost. Uh, we received backfill. What, I'm not sure what you mean by backfill. Well, we had a lot of businesses that might be a manufacturing business, for instance. And when they shipped outside of the city of Issaquah, the transaction was to the benefit of the city of Issaquah. When they started shipping to a third-party location in another state or in another city, that sales tax went to that jurisdiction. And it happened a lot. It happens primarily in wholesale, in manufacturing. It'll happen in some, uh, like, furnitures. Like, the best example is Macy's with a delivery truck. So Tukwila was a city hit particularly hard because they used to collect the sales tax at the Macy's um, distribution center regional center there, when they started delivering to all of the various communities, those communities are where the ones that benefited for, for, from the sales tax transaction. So what we did was back in 2008, we started doing analysis and all the cities worked with the Department of Revenue. We identified all the businesses we could at the time that we were beginning to see the changes. The state of Washington gave us databases, and then we had to analyze it and say, yes, that looks right, no, that looks wrong, and then that sort of became the foundation going forward. And so the, give me the basis for the 800000 you show up there. Um, 
the 800, I can, I was not here and I couldn't find the data, but I can speak based upon other cities. So the 800,000 was what was presumed at that time to be the estimated loss for the city of Issaquah based on the change of how um, consumer transactions were made. In that one year in 2008? Yes. And, okay, and so, okay, thank you. So it has not increased. And as you know, I think we have shared with you in particular with the 2015 legislation, legislative session coming up at the state level with some of the mandates that they have with the McCleary decision. Um, this is really potentially in jeopardy. We have been working with um, Doug Levy to, we've had some conversations with the governor stressing the importance of maintaining this funding source for us into the future. Uh, we've had some um, other meetings with our state legislators to explain to him that it funds some of our, a lot of our essential services. So we've been working really hard in anticipation of the 2015 legislative session to demonstrate that we really need to continue the source of funding. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, because this was the topic that I was trying to get at. How much revenue were we losing when the streamlined sales tax came in? And if I understand correctly, Diane, we haven't virtually lost any because the city, the state has made up for it on an annual basis based on metrics in 2008. It's the transactions that occurred in 2008. So if you have a business that has grown or anything like that, we have not received any growth factor on that. But that would have been the estimate for what we believed we lost. And every year we get that. We get that. And so that amount, that 800,000 is at the mercy of the state of Washington budget process. Correct. Thank you. So it's a whole different perspective. It was one of the things I think I was sitting down with Bob and I went, Bob, I said, you, I sort of had one of those aha moments. It's like why, I keep trying to understand why are we where we are at today and it's sort of going back starting in 1999 and looking at these different situations that have occurred. And one of the other things particularly during this period of time that would probably take a considerable amount of time in amongst all those, particularly beginning in the mid-1990s is when 601 came in and also that's when the state began imposing what they call unfunded mandates. So when you add a loss of revenue and it, on top of that they have given us mandates that we have to do that without the associated revenue. So that was part of that other piece of the, the balance of some of the challenges of why we're here today with some of the recommendations. Um, does, does that $800,000 ever get updated or? No. It's just a line item allocation in the budget, which, which is what makes us concerned that at any time the state could simply just eliminate it. So, you know, as um, the finance director said, we've heard that part of the potential solution for McCleary is going to be what types of local revenues uh, the state provides for revenue sharing, and that's one big one. So one of the other things was sort of looking at, um, at a minimum, particularly with property taxes, um, you know, you could have flatlined that is, and prior to 2001, we could have been receiving our 6%. But at a minimum, when we look at overall growth in the expenditures for the general fund, they typically follow the line of the increase of the consumer price index. So I was also trying to say, in, at, a, at a minimum, maybe we shouldn't have collected the 6%, but at a there's also the position that it also probably should maybe be tied to the CPI or some other index because our costs go up in relation to ship to the consumer price index. So what you can see is from 2002 in the gold line is the consumer price index. 
and the green line is our property taxes and in many cases you can see that period of time where the council chose not to impose the one percent so it starts out um, you can see how the the delta could have funded a lot of different programs over the period of time so we were just sort of curious to see how the the CPI index compared to what we were claiming as far as the one percent With that, I'll turn it over to Bob for a while. Thank you. So um, as part of the uh, budget process last year, there was a lot of discussion and presentation from the Economic Development Director about um, the B&O tax. And so one of the um, items that the Council uh, discussed at that time was looking at, you know, jointly with the administration on the B&O tax. Um, there's been no changes in the B&O tax since it was initially adopted in 2004. And so um, we worked together, uh, the finance director and I, Keith Niven, along with uh, council member Barber and Polly, um, on uh, a review of the B&O tax. And so we've identified four kind of objectives of this review. One was to ensure the long-term financial sustainability of the city's revenues. Two is looking at opportunities to invest in infrastructure and deferred maintenance uh, in the city. Um, and as you know, these will kind of go through and explain a little bit more on these things. Uh, third was looking at opportunities to reduce red tape um, and the filing requirements that businesses have uh, with the city. And then uh, lastly, to continue to meet operational objectives, primarily services of the city. So um, this is a, and we talked quite a bit about this, uh, review of the property tax. Um, from essentially 2004 to 2014, most of that increased since, you know, as, she t as uh, Diane talked about, the 1% uh, revenue uh, cap was a result of growth that occurred in the city. So most of that revenue adjustment there from that 4. Point, you know, 2 or 4.3 million up to what you see in 2010, up to 7 million, really reflects new growth that occurred in the city. Um, this is the other, uh, another primary source of revenue that the city gets. It's utility and gambling taxes. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what this revenue kind of encompasses? Um, as I shared earlier, this is the revenue that we get from the various utilities, our electric, our gas, our telephone, our cable, and our water utility. Gas, electric, and phone, are we're at the statutory limit of 6%. So we collect the maximum on that. Uh, the city at one time, probably, I don't know, but I'm guessing around 2005, um, had a utility tax on its own utilities, and then the council, the then council took that tax off. So when I look at 2005, I'm guessing that's probably about, and going into 2006, that might looks like about the time perhaps that council then decided not to tax its own utility. Under state law, if you tax your own utility, there is no limit as to the percentage. There are some communities in the state that go as high as 20%. So um, it's really a matter of local policy and council desire. So you have some flexibility in there. And gambling taxes are like pull tabs and stuff? Pull tabs. <laughs> okay. Yeah. In some cities, it's card rooms, but we don't have any here. So um, I think this, uh, this uh, slide is interesting. So this is uh, pretty, pretty much the sales taxes that we've received. And so what you, one of the things I think that's important is in 2005, you can see we received almost $9 million in revenue from the sales tax. Uh, in the 2014 budget, we still haven't hit that number that we had in 2005. Um, you can see the impact of the Great Recession there from 2008 down to uh, 2011. And frankly, 2011 would have also been a flat year, but for the fact that Swedish Hospital got built and that bump was really a reflection of the uh, sales tax revenue that was received on construction. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we'll be talking a little bit about is the fact that you know our economy has fundamentally changed. So we are now what you know traditionally you would be you'd be called a fully developed community. It's one of the things that. We, reasons we adopted the centralist co-op plan. 
um, you know, all those opportunities for greenfield development that we saw in the Highlands and Talus um, are gone. And so, you know, you had a very land, very low land basis and all that construction on, sa on all the sales tax and construction that occurred over that time period now is essentially gone. And so what we're going to see is a lot more uh, volatility in terms of overall construction because we may see a larger project like the, the hotel the Raleigh's are building this year that'll generate some revenues but it's not going to be a constant stream of built out neighborhoods that like essentially what we saw in Talos and Highland as those areas developed so going forward uh, you're really looking at um, generating revenue from sales tax from your existing retail base uh, and then periodic you know the periodic larger projects that'll be coming forward as we see the Central Isquah plan redevelop um, the second thing that's occurred is, uh, you know, for a long time in the 90s, uh, Issaquah was it for retail services. So when you think of uh, our, our retail um, base, uh, our retail base in terms of where individuals came to shop, is that on now? Yep, I must have hit the button. Um, so if you went to Costco, uh, you came to Issaquah, you know, at one time for retail. Now you've got a Costco over in Covington. Um, you look at some of the other uh, uh, retail development that's occurred in surrounding communities over in Redmond and over in, um, uh, you know, Covington. And um, a lot of those individuals came to Issaquah to shop during that time. And so we've essentially lost those sales within our community as a result of the development of those other areas. And then you can see uh, the B&O tax, which was implemented in 2004, and we have seen some steady growth um, in the B&O tax uh, during that time frame. And we are proposing an adjustment uh, in the B&O tax this year, um, and we'll go through a little bit more information on that in some later slides. Did you have a comment? Well, I was just going to add for 2014, we are close to our projection. We're running about maybe $50,000 ahead, behind same period of time compared to last year so it's it, we're not seeing growth like we would have anticipated <clears throat> and then the other revenues is just kind of a mix of it's primarily your charges for services whether it's in our jail operation or in DSD our municipal court so it's all those other operating departments that have what we call charges for services so one of the things that's interesting about this is, um, and it's not split out, but um, you can, to some extent, start to foresee where some of the development's going to occur in future years because there's a lag effect of when the permit revenue comes in versus when the actual construction gets built. And so um, we saw in 2012 to 2013 an increase in uh, revenues that occurred um, from you know planned new construction during that time period but uh, going into 2014 that's flat and then the DSD department is also forecasting um, a relatively well decrease if not flat revenues for construction going into next year as well on the um, sales tax uh, do we know um, what proportion of the sales and use tax is this construction tax and how much of it is retail 19% is construction, and the retail portion, I'm not sure, what off the top of my head. What would be the other one besides retail? Um, wholesaling, or printing services, or accommodations, or, but I would say the majority of the sales tax primarily is retail. Okay, yeah. And, you know, to give an example, um, you know, when the whole Highlands retail development uh, got built, um, the projected revenue that came off of that from sales tax was expected to be about $350,000. I think we about hit that, didn't we? Yeah. So uh, even that large development is only generating $350,000 in revenue per year. And as we go through the budget, you'll see it's the example I've liked to use. But, you know, the police department, for example, costs us $9 million a year of which 90% of that cost is approximately uh, salary because it's a very high intensive use. So just giving a 3% pay increase to um, our police department and officers generates about a $270,000 annual increase just in salary costs for one department. So um, if you start to spread that to a couple other departments, you'll see that you know, you're gonna need a 
a new Highlands development every year just to be able to keep up with that base, and that's not that's not going to happen. That's not uh, the likelihood of that isn't going to happen. We just don't have the land to do that anymore. So. I was going to say, normally in our quarterly report, we provide a graph that shows a breakdown of the sales tax distribution. So that's, if you want more information, we can. Okay. The other piece of that is, uh, I think one of the, is just the circulation effect. So even though we added, you know, that additional retail up there, um, it's hard to tell, you know, pinpoint exactly. But you look at, you know, we added uh, some of the stores that end up going there. We have competing stores within the city. So I'm sure some of that isn't necessarily new wealth or new sales generated. Some of it's just going to be a redistribution of sales within the community itself. Can we go back to the, can, can we go back to the previous slide just for a second? So we revamped, you said, um, fees for services. So we revamped our um, development, uh, our DSD fees substantially in the last budget cycle. Would that 2014 number sort of have cratered had we not done that? Crater? Crater. Cratered? Cratered. 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 Dropped off. It did already. Um, the 2014, this is the budget, and when I did our estimate, we actually review, reduced our development by about a half a million dollars for 2014. So while we did that fee increase between we just didn't see the development and it didn't occur the way we had anticipated. All right. Thank you. So um, this is a graph of the amount of a uh, number of B&O taxpayer accounts that we have and then um, essentially what they pay every year. So we're proposing uh, two uh, amendments, well, uh, two here on this slide, um, regarding uh, exemptions. So one of those is raising the exemption level. Right now it's $20,000 annually or $5,000 a quarter, and raising that exemption up to $100,000 annually. By uh, raising that exemption, approximately 1,380 taxpayers will now be exempt from paying B&O taxes on an annual basis. Um, what that reflects is those individual businesses that essentially pay $100 or less per year in B&O taxes to the city. Um, they would now be exempt. They have to file on an annual basis, and they'll still have to file on an annual basis because we got to verify for audit purposes that they don't, you know, they don't meet the income threshold. It's just an informational return. Right. But, you know, at least they, a lot of times we found that some of the individuals were paying more on the penalty for failing to file on time than what their actual tax was. So it didn't make a lot of sense to continue to do that. Um, so we have approximately 4,500 active B&O tax accounts in the city. Um, and we set up the categories in a way because we have to be cognizant of privacy uh, uh, rules uh, within the state of how those various uh, corporations are paying uh, B&O taxes to the city. They're split into six categories in terms of classification. We have 39 manufacturers that are paying the B&O tax, 447 wholesalers, 1,078 retailers, eight printing and publishers, 174 retail services, and then professional services and others, 928. So manufacturing, for example, would be uh, the Dairy Gold or uh, the, you know, Lake Sh Lake lakeside paving for example would be manufacturers that would be falling under that classification wholesaling may include um, some car dealers um, uh, would include costco uh, wholesale club other wholesale types of activities retailers um, obviously you have some small retail uh, businesses that may be represented like on front street or gilman village up to the big boxes that you see there in home depot and fred meyer um, small printers uh, we don't have very many of those. Um, the retail services may include, that um, might be like uh, just a landscaping business. Um, and then professional services and others are those uh, consulting businesses, legal businesses, medical uh, type, or you know, medical consulting, maybe some businesses along those lines. So when you look at the, just for the numbers, if you see that we have accounts by tax bracket, you'll see 2,603 
and then below that you'll see 2,674. The difference is, is you could have a business reporting in multiple categories. And so that the countdown below is the reporting categories and the middle section is the filing, the number of filings. Um, and I think for those members that have been on council, the categories, the reporting, the business classifications are, pretty, are a standard set of classifications that all the B&O tax cities agreed to many years ago. In our code, I think we have a section called 5.04 in our IMC, and it's called the Model B&O Tax Ordinance because it, it is the standardization because what businesses wanted several years ago was cities do it all the same. You know, don't have a different, don't be creating different classifications so that when, if you're like a Fred Meyer or something and you're doing business in multiple communities, standardize the classification so that there is consistency and it makes it easier for the business to do the filing. So we have all committed to those classifications. Any questions on that chart? Okay, so uh, this is the proposal um, that uh, we have in the various categories. So um, in the third column, you'll see what the current rate uh, is under the existing ordinance um, and uh, what the proposed rate is under the um, uh, ordinance. And so uh, we are proposing a two-step um, adjustment um, that would take place in 2015 and then t April 1st, 2015, and then uh, January 1, 2017 for manufacturing and wholesaling. So um, the first change uh, we're proposing is to go from 0 .008 um, to 0.0015, effective April 1, 2015 for manufacturing and wholesaling. And then the retailing is at 0 .008, would go up to 0 .0015, uh, April 1, 2015. And then printing, publishing, retail services, and services and other would go from 0 0.001 up to 0 0.0012. Um, the fifth column is a reflection of the current revenue that we receive from those various categories. And uh, the 2015 column reflects what the new revenue sort, what the new revenues we would anticipate coming in, just assuming a straight line appreciation. So obviously it's gonna be not exactly that amount because businesses have variances in the amount of revenues they have on an annualized basis, but taking a straight line you know, uh, account, that's what we would anticipate. And then in 2017, with the final adjustment, um, we would see that uh, change in manufacturing and wholesaling with the overall variance uh, reflected from what we're currently collecting, again, just using a straight line to what we would now, you know, the marginal adjustment in that final year. When's the effective date in 2017? Uh, January 1st. Um, the other piece uh, that we did, which you probably noticed uh, there in the agenda bill that made some pretty significant changes in the exemptions, um, and it, what it really was related, related to was that uh, previously the city had just a blanket exemption for all 5013C uh, uh, nonprofits, um, and that included uh, medical uh, facilities or medical services. And so what we are uh, proposing is uh, no longer exempting medical services. So, for example, Overlake, um, uh, Virginia Mason, potentially Swedish Hospital, um, and some of the other medical services that are currently exempt from the ordinance because they were 5013C would now be uh, taxed under this proposal. Um, and so as a result of that, we had to go through uh, and we use the city of Seattle as um, because they also tax uh, medical services as an example to go through and make sure we capture all the various exemptions that previously had just been covered under the 5013C exemption. Um, so the, the ordinance is going to be quite a bit longer than it was before, but that was the purpose behind it. And then again, the increase in the filing threshold, $200,000. There is um, the issue of, and do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, religious institution exemption that may impact that? For hospitals? Those hospitals that are a 5013 that have a religious affiliation, the, they are not taxed under federal law, so they would be exempt from the B&O tax. 
So what category do they fall under? Um, services and sales. Retailing yes. and... Um, Perhaps multiple? Yes. Retail services and... Retailing and retail services and potentially other services, depending on what they're doing. So if yep. they were doing um, physical therapy, for instance, that would be under services. I get a question. Um, on the filing threshold increase, mm -hmm. is there a, a line or a number that you have which has the estimated loss variance? In other words, when you aggregate the 1,000 and however many on the previous slide who will now be exempt, there's presumably going to be an aggregate loss variance that will offset the positive variance. So how much is that figure? We're estimating it's around 100,000 okay. for that one-third of the taxpayers. Okay, thank you. But that's reflected in your overall variance. Nina. Okay, so back to the 501c3s. They've been exempted, and they always were, right? The 501c3s. But what we're doing is removing the exemption for medical services over this threshold, except those that are affiliated with a religious uh, mission. Correct. Good summation. So and so, why was that distinction made? What distinction? That uh, medical services with a religious affiliation are different than other medical services. That's because it's under state under federal law; they're tax exempt, so we can't. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. So it's like a church. You know, yeah. we're not allowed to tax them. Okay, and I thought that was the case for five hundred one c threes. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The other point, you know, we'll probably be bringing an amendment because one of the things that, um, in conversations with Bob, we're um, in reading through this. I'm not sure there. We need to include an exemption for the village theater because, as it stands, they would not. The way the language currently reads, they would not be exempted from a tax. So we would have to come back with an amendment to include them under the exemption. It was not our intent to include them, but I think when we use the city of Seattle model ordinance, they didn't exempt their theaters in town, and so it just didn't get caught in the first drafting. But as we went through and reviewed it, we discovered that was the case, and so our intent was that the Village Theater would not, uh, would not I mean, they would be exempt. They would not be subject to and the tax. And they're currently not. And they're currently not paying the tax. Okay. Next page. So, um, uh, one of the things uh, that you see that you saw earlier in the book, um, and uh, we want to give you a little perspective on, was the city employment that's occurred since um, 2008. And so we have uh, had to do a number of things over the last several years. We've had two uh, layoffs that occurred during that time frame. We did a reorganization of our uh, planning, building, and um, planning and building department uh, into a new development services division. Um, and then we also, during that same time, knew that we had to change given, one, that we were moving to a redevelopment model instead of a, a greenfield development model. Um, and two, meeting the services that our residents are expecting. So, you know, when it comes to communication, social media, all of those types of services, we still had a, a need and desire to be able to communicate to our residents in that fashion. And so um, we also, even, even though that reflects total employment, um, we have cut additional positions and we've added some positions, but those new ads were generally as a result of repurposing the money that had been uh, you know, filling a uh, position before, and then that repurposed money went to fill like the social media coordinator or the two economic development managers that we have on the city. Um, one of the things uh, as well was that we used to have an MDRT, 
um, and that was fully funded by uh, development costs. So Port Blakely and Talus essentially paid for all those expenses. And um, with uh, the wind down of the villages, those uh, positions then no longer were receiving those revenues. Um, and those four individuals that are in that department now are fully funded by the general fund. Um, so we had one individual back in 2007 that the city created, which was our economic development manager. Um, we obviously, as part of the reorg, uh, created a much more robust economic development program and outreach uh, to the community. And it's just the, the fact is the challenges involved with redevelopment is a lot more difficult than it is to, to just build off a you know, plain piece of property. Um, the, as uh, I think Diane already talked about, really the changes that occurred from 2013 to 2014 and even in, from 2012 to 2013 have primarily been um, additions to the police department, you know, public safety services during that time. Um, and then in 2014, two of those positions, we had previously contracted out for inspection services and then we brought that back in house um, and used our, our own city inspectors and DSD. I got a question for me. There's a table in the budget at page 4-12 that I had, I had a question about, so I might as well ask it because it's tied into this. How is number of payroll employees different than city employment? Because that table shows what I consider a pretty significant jump between 2012 and 2013 in quote-unquote number of payroll employees. And then I look at this chart that just says city employment and the numbers are a lot lower. So there, uh, <clears throat> what's reflected in that is um, this is a consolidated number. And so um, these are, so you may have a part-time non-regular that, like a lifeguard that works eight hours uh, a week, you know, and you take that on an annualized basis. So they would be considered a payroll employee, but you have to take that as a percentage and roll that up into FTEs. And so what that is is full-time equivalencies. And also during the summertime, our payroll can go up to an additional 200 people working on a part-time basis. So summer day camp would be an example of that, for example. Okay. Next. Actually, can I, can I just comment? Um, on that, the statement that you made that most of that growth um, looked to be police, it actually looks to be about half police and half DSD, right? DSD, is, they've both grown about three and a half FTEs. Yeah, that's what I meant. So two of those were the inspectors in DSD, um, and then there was a senior planner, and then the other ones were in the police department, so. Right, two more officers and some associated. Exactly. Yeah, I think there were three over time. There's but been three new officers since I've been here. But it may have been, again, one of the things they did was kind of reallocate based on, so they took some admin positions and they put some of that money into um, whether it was a record supervisor or putting it on the street for patrol. So there was some, I think, variances there. All right. Well, they, they call out officers and they go from 19 to 21. Yeah. So. But, okay. Okay, next. So um, coming back to the theme of uh, uh, the fact that we're pretty much fully developed, these are the remaining annexations um, that uh, exist um, in our the city's PAA. So Lake Sammamish State Park, which obviously we're in the process of doing that annexation now. Um, the East Cougar Mountain uh, potential annexation area, which is on my left. And then the, what we call the King County Island, which is essentially, there's a roads, uh, county roads facility that's located just directly up the hill from our road maintenance facility. That's in King County. They never annexed into the city. Um, you know, the Kalahani area was part of our PAA. Now that is in the process of being um, removed from the PAA and moved into Sammamish. So we don't have, unless, unless the uh, county ends up changing the growth boundary, uh, we really don't have any, you know, future uh, potential growth uh, in the city other than redevelopment, what's already existing there. Uh, and this is just a comparison of per capita revenue to several cities. Do you want to talk a little bit about this one, Diane? 
So this was some work that we had done for a study for the state legislators. We were asked earlier this year to collaborate with a number of cities to help the state legislator understand what's been happening to us over the years. And once we pulled this data together and then did a comparison with the other cities, I was actually quite surprised to look at how we fared to compared to everyone else. So this, if, this includes um, all of our revenue sources in the general fund as well as our special revenue funds. And you can see that in comparison the other communities, we have seen the most dramatic decrease in our revenue stream on a per capita basis. And part of it is uh, because of annexations and just an increase in development, but it does tell a very interesting story about how our per capita revenue has changed compared to the surrounding communities. I'm sorry, can I, can I ask one question about that? Sure. How did our friends in North and Redmond manage to buck the trend so <laughs> severely? <laughs> That part I don't know. I mean, I, you know, individually what's happening to those other communities, I really don't know. I think, you know, one of the things that might be interesting, so the Redmond Town Center obviously developed yeah. during that time frame, and then I'm not sure when they instituted the, was it before that time, mm -hmm. before 2004? Uh, so I'm kind of guessing. The other piece I would think would be, um, I'm not sure when they instituted the head tax. So that may have uh, occurred during some, you know, during that time. Yeah. They do in a per, per employee tax in Redmond. And matter of fact, one of the things they've proposed for their budget next year is a $15 increase in the uh, per employee head tax. You know, I, I have to say this is actually one of the most interesting charts I think I've ever seen on council. Because if you look at the services we provide, um, you know, we go to toe to toe with you know, there's, there's lots of great communities in the state, but I mean, just to, to see this, it really is amazing to me and, uh, and just speaks to how efficient the city is. Now, you mentioned this includes the utility revenues. No, our special revenues, which would be like our admissions tax and our lodging tax, um, but it's not our utilities. It's just so our general fund plus some of our smaller operations. Um, Okay, and so and so that's true then across for all of these. Yeah. We're comparing apples yeah. to apples. Thank you. Because not all of those cities have utility right. operations. So that sort of leaves us on the B and O tax conversations, unless um, there's more questions or you. Well, um, the one thing the slide that wasn't up there, and I asked Jen to come. Uh, this evening and she's going to speak a little bit about our outreach to the community that we've already begun to do um, so Jen Davis is our you want to grab a seat good evening so um, we are actually uh, we've worked with the chamber we've been to the chamber several times to the board to talk about the proposal as it has developed and um, we, uh, as of last Tuesday morning, have sent a letter out to all the B&O taxpayers for the city of Issaquah. And so that explained about the changes and told them about the two open houses that we're going to be having um, over in the Eagle Room on two, next Tuesday, October 14th. That one's going to be in the morning between 7.30 and 9, and we can send you this information. And then the next one will be on Monday, October 27th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. So we wanted to make sure we had one in the morning, one in the evening, so that business owners could uh, choose a time that works best for them to come and hear more from us about the B&O tax changes. And so we'll have a lot of the same information that we had here in this presentation. And Diane and Bob and myself, as well as Sheldon Lynn, will be there to uh, a answer any questions they may have. And also, I should mention that we are, um, Bob and myself will be meeting with the largest, uh, the larger B&O taxpayers individually and talking to them. So we actually had one of those meetings and, and uh, we'll continue to work down that list. Question? Um, does that include new B&O, potential new B&O taxpayers? Yes. Such as hospitals? Yes, and, the hospitals, okay. yes. And well. I thought that there was one more um, touch point with the chamber. I thought there was one more meeting uh, with their ad hoc committee or something that was oh, going to happen. Perhaps, yeah. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Uh, it was certainly discussed with the chamber uh, president, and what we haven't gotten yet is confirmation of when that meeting would be. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 
that was easy. <laughs> All right, I'm leaving. We're just doing it. We already have two minutes. <laughs> Do you, uh, you want to continue on or you want to take a quick two-minute break, five-minute break? Yeah, let's do that. When that clock up there, when the big hand's on the 26 after, we'll start again. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back. Welcome back from the commercial break. <laughs> All right, we're ready to we're talk. continue. So, Charlie Bush from Development Services is here. Welcome, Charlie, and Chris. Welcome. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and cover the technology surcharge uh, that's proposed in the budget. And you have an agenda bill as well uh, that was referred to this meeting, so it should be as a part of your packet. So currently we have a 1.3% uh, fee uh, that's tacked. It's an e-plan surcharge that's tacked on to, to permits. And it's a pass-through for the eGov Alliance. It basically covers the, the cost of mybuildingpermit.com, which is a core service the eGov Alliance uh, put in place many years ago. It really is what started the eGov Alliance. And what we're proposing to do is increase that fee to 5%. One of the key reasons for that is eGov Alliance uh, fees have changed, and there's been a significant increase. Uh, there's a new interlocal agreement, and mybuildingpermit.com is essentially being rebuilt. There are a bunch of technology investments that are being made. We're looking to cover those. Uh, otherwise, we would be having to absorb a significant amount of that into our budget. Um, so we're looking to increase the fee, and that would also allow us to um, make some other technology investments that are needed in the department. We could talk about those in more detail as we go. So th this fee would specifically be on development-related services. We ran a few example projects through, found that it was anywhere between a 1% to a 3.6% increase, depending on the type of project. And we actually have um, a handout uh, that Christopher's provided around to you with some more detail that he'll cover in a second. Um, Basically, this would help us streamline our processes. In the agenda bill, as an attachment, is a, uh, a, an attachment from a letter from, my, from the uh, Master Builders Association, which basically supports uh, the 5% increase. Other cities have been going through the same experience. A couple of other cities are at 5% currently. Bothell and Snoqualmie are the other two. Kirkland recently, uh, or is in the process of going to 3.5%. A number of other cities are at 3 uh, but as the increase for eGov uh, comes through, uh, cities are gradually making adjustments as they go through their budget process uh, to try to absorb the increase. And the, the uh, master builder's letter uh, actually mentions looking at uh, efficiencies and budget reductions and, and things to, uh, to help absorb the cost of the eGov increase. So they mentioned 5%, but then they also talk about Kirkland's 3.5%. Uh, through this budget process, we went through a pretty exhaustive experience in development services of going line item by line item and, uh, and, and identified over $150,000, almost $200,000 in savings. So we've been through that process, but even with that, uh, we're still uh, in need of, of uh, taking a look at this fee increase to help absorb. I'm sorry, Charlie? Yes. C could you say a little bit more about this savings you identified? or? So we went through our budget line item by line item in detail. Uh, this time around, and identified savings in, in a variety of line items in our budget. And so when you look at our, once you get into expenditures at some point, you'll see, when you look at the development services budget, that it's, it's essentially flat. It's actually gone down a little bit. So despite increases in wages and benefits and other things, you'll see that it's pretty well flat. So we're providing uh, some lower level of service with less money. That's the proposal for, uh, for 2015. So with that said, um, the estimated another revenue question, increases. Question, excuse me. Yes. Stacy has a question. Yes. Can you explain a little more about what you mean by um, funding to continue to streamline our process? Yes. So technology is a really key uh, efficiency tool. And uh, our technology systems are critical uh, to helping us with that. MyBuildingPermit.com in particular is super helpful to the business community. It's also super helpful to us. For example, if somebody wants to schedule an inspection, they go on my building, <coughs> mybuildingpermit.com, they schedule that inspection, and it automatically pops onto the calendar of, of our inspectors, and they show up at work in the morning with their list, and they go out, and they do their inspections. The alternative to that would be something where they'd call in, they have to talk to somebody, you know, get on the calendar, might take some back and forth, and, uh, and, and it's a lot less efficient. So technology really does fuel a lot of what we do and how we do it, and uh, that's an example of certainly how it's, how it's helping us. Yes, there are other items, there are some investments, and I'm gonna, I don't wanna steal Christopher's thunder here, so I'm, I'm gonna save that for him. There are a variety of projects that I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually turn it over to him right now to cover. All right, thank you. Um, I, I gave you a handout <laughs> 
just a moment ago, and, and I'll kind of summarize it real quickly. Um, in, the, in the colored bar chart that you see there, basically uh, everything up until the line that's between the orange and the green line, everything that's listed there, those are all things that we currently uh, spend money on, that we currently do, and that we need to continue to do. And the difference is that uh, right now we're only taking in 1.3%, uh, and that's uh, just a pass-through that goes to, uh, to the eGov Alliance. So all of those other things, between the 1.3% and, and where that green line is, uh, is coming out of the general fund. And so that's, that's part of what I wanted to explain. And then beyond the green line, uh, beyond stuff that we're uh, currently doing, uh, we've uh, given two examples uh, that we would put that money towards. And one would be uh, for reserves for major projects. And then the other uh, significant project would be for document scanning uh, and document management system, for scanning our archives and then managing those documents. And so, um, and, and just to give you an idea of uh, kind of the projects that fall into e either of those categories, with regard to reserves, um, uh, an example that, I, that I'll use is uh, several years ago when we uh, had been using a, a particular permit tracking software permit plan for many years, and we liked it, worked real well, but with uh, pretty short notice, uh, the company that was uh, supporting that said, we're not going to support that anymore. And so we pretty quickly had to find a new program uh, and, and, and pay for that and find the funding for it. And so we don't want to be in that position again, uh, and we don't want to put you in that position again. So that's an example of what that reserve would be for. Another example would be, you know, we're still, we're pretty early in the electronic plan review stage, you know, and it's really been uh, phenomenally successful and well-received. Uh, not just by uh, internally by the permit technicians and plan reviewers, but the applicants are really uh, appreciating and seeing the benefits of it. So that's just going to continue to grow and expand. Like I said, we're in the early stages of it, and with with any technology thing, as you know, the more we get into it, the deeper we get into it, the more we'll find. You know what? If we had this other program, or if we had this other component. Uh, it would be even better. So, you know, we, we just know that that's what's going to happen. So that, those are a couple examples of what could be in the reserves. Um, with regard to the document managing and the archive scanning, uh, it's, as it says here, the overall cost estimate that we have for that is $150,000. We know it would be hard to get all of that at once, um, so we would spread it out over a few years. And... As far as the necessity of that is, uh, uh, as far as that goes, as, as somebody you know who's dedicated his life to improving our processes and making them more efficient, uh, I think that is just an essential piece, and we need to get going on it. Uh, the, the inefficiency of having archive boxes all over City Hall Northwest uh, is just too much. So um, that's what those pieces mean and, and where we propose to be uh, using that 5%. And another good example that's related to what Charlie talked about is uh, um, handheld, um, what's the? Tablets, I iPads, basically, for, for inspectors. For the inspectors, yeah. Because yes. one of the things, again, as we've gotten into doing more things electronically, we've realized that uh, not only can these inspections come in electronically, as, as Charlie was describing, but now the field inspectors would be able to sign off and write corrections and everything just from tablets in the field. So it just, it's, it's, it is all for efficiency. One of the things, if I might add, you know, particularly document imaging and document storage is not just unique to development services. Um, this last budget, when the departments were submitting their request, I would say probably three other departments put requests in for document imaging. So it's a very expensive to get into it initially, but at some point in time, you know, I know the city clerk has, you know, we've had some conversations about hold the, the whole doc document management system. So we, we actually, 
they are a good starting point, but I just wanted to make sure the council understood that this is really a citywide issue that will be coming forward over the years. Thank you. Christopher? Uh, just to make sure I understand your, your paper your correctly here. So the full colored bar uh, represents all of the programs and initiatives elements uh, that are technology related costs and what we could cover with a 5% surcharge. Right. Uh, and then, then each of the colored bands, the, that's the, the legend down below tells you, you know, what they are now. Okay. Um, and so halfway between the 3% and the 4% is approximately 3.5%. <laughs> So what's the, I, I, what I don't understand is the um, I think you were referencing that point when but what's the purpose of the eighty thousand hundred thousand two hundred hundred and twenty thousand what's those what's the the x axis values what do they represent that's the amount of revenue that's the amount of revenue that can be budgeted okay so we have one hundred forty plus thousand Building. revenue in the budget it and it represents a technology surcharge of up to five percent. And this is the breakdown of how that all will be applied, overlaid with uh, the amounts per component, if I can call it that. Okay. All right, thank you. Is that it? I think the one thing I just want to say is, you know, there's already a, uh, at least one position and that uh, they are going to be down next year and so the more that we can continue to make these investments in technology to make the department more efficient, the flatter the organization is and unfortunately has been going as we're seeing continued development uh, drop. So um, if we can continue to work towards, you know, getting all that paper that's been, you know, implemented and provided to us over the years and make it uh, optical character recognition and make it uh, much more searchable and efficient for our staff that's going to help us a lot so Our next topic is the Agenda Bill 6907. It's the Parks and Recreation Resident Non-Resident Fee. And I wanted to ask if you've all had a chance to uh, re read and review it. I'm seeing a, I'm seeing a no <laughs> from Nina. <laughs> okay. Okay, this proposal in front of you, this Agenda Bill in front of you, uh, in an effort to, to increase revenues in the city, uh, our staff researched uh, regional recreation fees um, to learn more about resident, non-resident fee structures. Our staff researched Bellevue, Covington, Kirkland, Maple Valley, Mercer Island, Redmond, Renton, Sammamish, Seattle, and the Sideview Metropolitan Park District up in North Bend. And on the back of your agenda bill is the research from all those cities as well as a really nice picture of our basketball kids. Uh, anyhow, uh, what we found is that um, it's the uh, differential is usually 20% between residents and non-residents. And so that's what was presented in the mayor's budget. Uh, we would have to phase this in because we begin advertising actually for 2015 right now. Um, we have a lot of uh, residents who are very, very organized and they want to assign, thing, uh, assign up their children for things ahead of time. So this would be a phased approach and we would not have all the fees implemented probably till next year at this time. Any questions? Sorry, I just wanted to add a comment. So philosophically, um, because the Parks and Recreation Depar Department doesn't recover 100% of their you know, cost through fees. So essentially the general fund or taxes are paying to help underwrite some of the costs. And so that's the philosophical basis for the 20% um, surcharge. So in, in the last bullet says may not be applicable to the pool. Could you explain? That's, that's correct. We're researching our 1994 King County interlocal agreement. 
signed um, almost exactly 20 years ago, and we're having our uh, legal uh, department review that. Um, when we took on that pool, there was a paragraph in there about not raising um, or not having non-resident fees, and so we're going to review that. In perpetuity? There was that phrase in perpetuity there, Paul. Oh, no. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, yeah, we'll I think, see what Wayne finds out. Yeah, part of the philosophy is when does it cease being the old pool and when is it a new pool? And so essentially we're building a new pool under an old structure, and I think that's the kind of the legal aspect that we've asked Wayne to look at. Ah, is there any consideration for um, discussions with Sammamish particularly, I suppose it could apply to others. We have a lot of residents who take advantage of programs in neighboring jurisdictions. And, you know, is there any potential for an interlocal where they don't charge our folks, we don't charge their folks, mm. but this only applies to non-residents of other cities so that we can actually partner with our neighbor and, and then there's a reciprocity perhaps involved where mm -hmm. our residents save money and theirs save money that way? Mm -hmm. You know, we haven't considered that, Joshua, but we certainly could. It's a, just part of our ongoing partnership with our, mm -hmm. our neighbors in Sammamish, particularly. I think you'd also probably want to look at the degree that another neighboring community has a fully developed parks and rec program. Um, typically your older communities have your stronger parks and rec programs. The newer cities rely on typically YMCAs to deliver those programs. So after trying to find an apples to apples comparison would be important. You know, Bob, you, 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 you use the word philosophical or whatever to explain the 20%. Of course, the, in, the, uh, in the agenda bill, you know, re it says it's based upon research comparing. We, we see the data here. We compare. I'm going to ask you to repeat the philosophical comment. <laughs> so, uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, so primarily because fees don't cover 100% of the costs affiliated with recreation programs, the general fund or our local taxpayers are essentially paying for the variance, the marginal variance between the revenue received from the users and the expenses affiliated with the program. And so because non-residents aren't uh, paying direct taxes to the community, the variance is to cover those, that kind of in, su in supplement to the general fund. Okay, thank you. I, I just wanted to make sure it didn't explain the actual number of 20%. That's it. And I didn't think you were trying to explain that. It's just, you know, and yeah, the basis is really clear. So um, that's all. Thank you. One of the things I would share with the council is um, the community I live in doesn't have a parks and rec program. And I'm um, an avid um, student of golf lessons. I take a lot of golf lessons, and that might explain why I'm not very good at golf, but I'm more than happy to pay that 20% surcharge to my neighboring community in order to get those golf lessons. So, um, And it really doesn't seem, it's not that much when you're maybe looking at golf lessons of $35. You know, so. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Brian. Uh, we got a couple more things on general fund expenditures. So it was really interesting because we spent a lot of times, I think, setting the foundation for this council in previous years and really talking through the expenditures. And so when I was preparing on the expenditure side, I was having a hard time coming up with a really interesting story to talk about what's different compared to the 2014 budget. Um, so a lot of this is actually going to go rather quickly. When 
when we gave the budget instructions, because we knew we needed to um, re restrict the growth in the overall operations, the instructions to the department was um, the finance department would budget for the applicable salaries and benefits based upon the information that we have. And then the departments had only a 1% increase in what we call their discretionary items. So that would be everything outside of salaries and benefits. So they only received a 1% increase. So when you see some of these variances, it's, you know, in some cases if you have a rather what I would call a young department where you have newer employees, you know, the employees would get a salary increase as, and as well they would get a, a, their annual merit increase if they met that. So there would, that's why some of them would be higher than other ones where if you have a more senior department, they're at the top of their salary range. So in looking at the various departments, when you sort of go down the list and you look at the variances, and we'll talk about the ones in the next slide, the ones, but um, the first thing is I would encourage you to spend a little bit of time in going through your budget and looking at the accomplishments and the work programs for the department. So I think within the existing resources of each of the departments, they're all striving to make their departments better and they all have are all including new types of programs or new efficiencies or something to make it a little bit better for either their customers or internal, for their internal customers or their external customers. So when I start going down the list, there's really not much to say about the legislative department. The only thing that's interesting in the municipal court is they're looking at taking that one court security officer and making it a regular part-time person. In the executive office, it's just pretty much business as usual. There's really, there's no special funding for any special programs. Um, the same thing in the finance department. The one thing we have a slight increase is because of the um, cost of the Munis system and our um, annual monthly fee that we'll be paying. Don't you also have the project manager? The project manager is funded outside of the general fund because we had set some money aside so it doesn't impact the general fund. What we did was we, over the years, as part of the equipment rental fund, we've been collecting money for the last, um, the previous finance director for like the last 10 years, they've been setting money aside in order to do this eventual replacement. So Nice. Uh, the legal department we'll be talking about, they've had, they'll see an increase, so we'll be talking a little bit more specifically about them. Um, support services, their increase, there's some cost if you, when we get down to the city clerk, you'll see the city clerks transferred some of their operating costs to the support services. Um, so really, and their overall delta increase is not significant. Human resources, business as usual, um, the IT, we in, pretty much business as usual. We had hoped to fund, um, they originally were a department of five and a half FTEs, and currently they're at three FTEs with some external resources to provide them with day to day PC help. Originally, in, uh, when we started going down and developing the budget, we were hopeful that we could keep the PC tech to bring that position back in-house. But when we were trying to balance the budget, we weren't able to um, commit to that position. City clerk, um, no changes there. The police department, um, not a significant increase. And part of their increases, they have been hiring a lot of new officers. So compared to a couple of years ago when we had senior officers, they're coming at the lower scale. And so their overall increase is small. Um, fire department is our largest increase. Communication, very constant. Human services, we have the, pa uh, we'll talk about them a little bit more. Development services, Charlie said he was flat, and he is, but what that really is, that's that expedited review, so it's the revenue coming in and the money going out for third-party review that the developers pay for. 
economic development, flat um, parks and rec. They've actually gone down. We'll be talking about that in their reorg, and then non-departmental went up. Um, so, so part of our next conversation. Well, before we go, so part of our conversation is the budget though went up eight percent. You know, it went up 2.9 million. So that's really when you take all those departments, they're pretty much constant. So where are we going to have the conversation? And the conversation is going to be on the next slide. So what I try to do was to say, okay, what's different between 14 and 15 that's causing the budget to go up 7%, which effectively is about a $2.9 million increase. That $2.9 million is part of the challenge that we had in trying to balance the budget. When you look at most of these items that we'll be discussing, they're really outside of the city's control. Those are things that we simply have to pay for services versus um, going in and maybe eliminating a line of business or reducing services. So the overall inc change between the 14 and 15 budget is 2.9 million. Of that, we have two items where there is an increased expense, but there is an associated revenue to pay. So it, it, it accounts for the overall increase in expenditures, but there's an offsetting revenue. So that's our expedited review for development services. It's budgeted at 1.79 million, and then our drug-free coalition grant. Um, one of the things about the Drug-Free Coalition grant, originally we thought we were just simply going to be their fiscal agent and pay their bills. Once we got the grant agreement, we came to understand that the grant award was really to us as a municipality, and they became our um, uh, sub-recipient of the grant. So that's just money in and money out. So then the real conversation in my mind as far as the 2015 general fund budget is around these items that are up here. So the first item is legal fees at 182000 above what we had. These are items above what we had originally anticipated. And um, the first one is primarily because of our public defense. We have increased the cost. 40% over what we're seeing. There is some conversation at the state level that that amount could actually go up to 100%. So we sort of took the middle of the road um, that our cost for per case for public defense could double from around $250, $250 to $300 a case to $450. So that one is sort of a wait and see. We went ahead and did a 40% increase. Fire and EMS is going up 607,000 over the 2014 budget. Part of that is the uh, overall increase in the operating budget. And then as we've shared with the council, it's also the reallocation of the delivery of services with station 78 because they're opening up this new station. We then have to absorb more costs for Station 72, right? Um, arch dues went up uh, more than the projected 3%. They went up an additional 13,000. Charlie and Christopher talked about our eGov fees. They went up 49,500 higher. Um, we had to, we provided funding for the full-time human services manager, which is 56000 Question about that. Does this reflect just an increase over the 2014 budget, or is it, in, in, this is the in, increase over 2014, or is this the total yes. amount? It's the increase. This is just the net increase. Right. So legal fees for public defense will probably be... I mean specifically about the human services manager. Oh. Because yeah. it wasn't funded full right. year. Last year, it was, we funded it for this year just for half a year. Right. And this, yes, and in this proposal, it's a full year, January 1st hiring, assuming, you know, we're, we're not going to begin recruitment or anything until the budget's done, but um, we would anticipate, you know, it's full year funded. But... Uh, but our total authorized positions in 2015 is down, and how can we list this out if we're actually 
down aggregate staff. Don't don't you then if you if you have to put that line in there, then you also have to subtract out the, the positions that you've taken out, right? That's an apples to apples. Yeah. Well then. All right. She said bad news first and good news later. All right. We said Paul is gonna ask this question. Thank you very much. Um the one the one thing we uh as the organization becomes downsize, right size, whatever sizing you want to call it, it becomes harder and harder when we have some of our senior folks um, retiring or separating from service. In the past, because we've had some sufficient resources, when a person has retired, we have been able to hold that position vacant until such time as we cost recovered that payout. So if somebody left in January and we had sick leave and vacation and anything else that we had to pay them and let's say it was $60,000, then we would hold that position vacant until we had recovered it. But as we are eliminating and downsizing that for many of our departments, that becomes a hardship. And if you're in a department of three or four people and you have to hold that position vacant for a year, services will suffer and things will not get done. So we, I put in 300,000 to assist the departments based upon the number of retirements we believe will happen. This does not fully fund it. It probably funds it about 65%. So the departments would still have to hold the positions vacant for a while. But that, but it would be manageable because they would probably have that position vacant while they're going through a recruitment. So, so what we've, you know, we put in that budget, that ability to help those departments for those known ret or expected retirements. Then we have um, the funding of the council goals on the drug-free community. Their your goal, so that was seventy thousand. Um, funding for the street operations, we have been using the cash balance in the fund over the last several years in the street operating fund, and we sort of have ran out of money. And so now we have to um, infuse some additional money to maintain their level of service, and that was above and beyond what I had anticipated when we started working with the numbers, and so that was an additional 483000 and then we had been funding the ORCA program out of sustainability, and it is more applicable to um, a general, the departments and where those employees reside. And with the majority of the employees, this is an additional obligation in the general fund of 40000 So that sort of explains the, the difference. And you can see that um, we have a difference to the good in the sense that the di net difference is 1.7 million, but the new funding request was 1.8 million. So how did we get there? What we did was we had savings, particularly in parks and recreation. So the reorganization of the aquatics division, the future long-term savings is around 293,000. It'll be a little slightly less this coming year because we'll have some payouts that we'll have to do. We also have the elimination of the city arborist. Um, Long-term savings is of 125,000. We, what we did was, um, for those instances where we might need to bring a professional in, we gave them an additional 30,000 in their professional services if they had to bring an arborist in for a particular task. Um, part, and we're not filling the senior planner and the assistant planner position, so that's the savings over 2014 of 225,000. Part of it in our conversation with Charlie is because he's actually seen some decrease in activity, he felt comfortable holding those positions. Now, if development activity that is above and beyond, that is the traditional development activity, not the expedited, then we would come to you and say, we're seeing an increase in development activity. There is an offsetting revenue to help support that position, and we would like to fund that position. Do I recall correctly, Charlie, saying just earlier this evening that they're actually delivering similar or more services with less staff? Did I remember? Did I hear that? Mm -hmm. 
He did. That seems in conflict with what you just said, that he was forecasting less demand. Well, because he's down those positions that he originally was authorized. So he's doing work that, in tw that he had more people for in the past. And going forward, he says, I can, con those positions just recently became vacant. And he said, I can hold them vacant. And I, I would say it's a combination. So when we went through, we did a Kaizen event for both our land use process and our building permit processing. And so, for example, the land use processing, we cut 100, I think 100 days off the amount of time, the cycle time that was involved with, you know, once it hit the city to when the actual permit is issued. So some of that is the efficiency that we're seeing. The second piece of that is we're just expecting less development to occur. So we're able to... You know, as a result of some of the less development, we're able to cut those positions and then becoming more efficient. Otherwise, it may not be a full two positions that you probably would have seen cut. It probably would have been less than that. Um, I think the other piece <clears throat> that is different here is there's really two controls the council has. One is what we call the position control, which is a position authorization that mm -hmm. you have in the budget. And the second thing is the actual cash that gets appropriated to the budget. So. These were not eliminated from the position control. So if there's a ends up that we end up getting a lot more, you know, work come in next year, we'd have the ability to uh, start that recruitment, but we'd still have to go to the council and make a mid-year adjustment for whatever the anticipated expenditure and revenues would be. So uh, these items, uh, expenditure reductions for 2015, are they included in the general fund expenditures chart here? Yes. So with um, development services, the savings for not filling those positions is included in the amount that has that. Um, Correct. The increase, the increase being already explained by the by the million dollars so his million dollars is just the pass-through money and when you look at it overall he effectively reduced it the two positions plus the hundred and fifty he said earlier by finding efficiencies in his department so he's really aligned his department based upon his critical needs and where does the arborist savings um, which Department to parks and facilities. That's parks, okay. Yeah. And uh, human right. resource goes to human human services. Okay, thank human you. Human resources. Human resources. <coughs> oh, I see. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Carson, no. Is the human resources director different than the human services manager? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So we're, we are now going to fill a manager position, but leave the director position vacant. Mm -hmm. So the human re human resources is our HR department, and so we've oh, been. Oh, We've been holding that vacant for a while. The human services is, totally yeah. yeah. So what this really is saying is if you go and look at the overall change in the general fund budget, the majority of the increases, the 1.8 million, is the piece that if we had not, if we had, I, if we set that aside and we looked at the general fund revenues and expenditures, by doing the reductions, those reductions were able to fund the increases in salaries and discretionary costs. So had we not had those third party transactions we had to deal with, our budget would have been balanced without any request for revenue increases. Does that make sense? For one year. For one year. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but I think the thing is what we're trying to do, and the mayor was very clear when we put the budget together, is we want to build long-term financial sustainability for the yeah. city. And so um, those costs that were included in there, they're ongoing costs that yes. are going to be built into the future. So... There we're going to, they would have had to been that revenue would have had to been built into the well, budget. Well, yes, analysis. but but the cause of that long term is a yes. lot of the things that are outside the city's control. I couldn't repeat what you said if I tried. 
I know. I tried really. You d and you did a great job. I understood <laughs> every word. I, th I think I understood every word individually. <laughs> well, when I when I was trying to do this, I had like three or four people go, "Okay, does this even make sense? Because it's it, so hard it to was tell this really story." It was good. Could you repeat that, please? <laughs> I think so, I could no, try and help. I think, yeah. and I'll probably, and you'll probably say the same thing. I think two things. One is we've got negotiated salary increases for next year, uh, and then we're projecting salary increases for just exempt staff as part of that. Um, and so, without the cuts that we ended up providing for that we talked about uh, there, plus the one percent variance in the operating costs. Um, that really reflects, you know, a big part of the changes in the overall budget. So um, the other piece was all those kind of one-time costs, so the fire department, you know, EFER increases, some of those things are kind of outside of the control of the city. We had to pay for those expenses this upcoming year. We don't, if we had, if we had not proposed a B&O tax increase, we would not have been able to balance the budget um, for these new services going forward. So we were kind of like, we took, the, we took the budget, we made reductions in expenses to cover the ongoing costs of the city because you've got your standard kind of baseline costs plus your salaries and some CPI adjustments. And then we had this whole new kind of additional costs that have been built on that are now kind of built into the future expenses of the city and we had to find some new revenue to be able to essentially what you yeah. said, to pay for those ongoing costs that are now built into the kind of the base budget of the city. I don't so know if that helped at all. All these costs up here are now <laughs> ongoing obligations. They're not one-time obligations. So let me take a bit this. So um, what you're saying is that if we had not had these issues, you wouldn't have had to go after new revenues because you cut your other line items to match the increases you're going to expect. Right. But we have these. So we had to go find other revenues, and they're ongoing, and you found ongoing revenues. Yes. Thank you. Do you have an you had engineering or English degree? Because I was very <laughs> well done. New ongoing covered by new ongoing expenditures covered by new on, by ongoing revenue. That's yeah. a, that's, he said it in yeah. six words or less. Well, yeah. it was maybe sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> We've been practicing enough. Right. We're getting we're synthesizing All again. Right. Any other questions on this slide, or should we go on? So, I mean, really, I think what we're trying to do is synthesize the major changes in the budget um, for you in this primary slide. So, next. Which I appreciate because that's one of the exercises we struggled through last year. So, I appreciate you focusing on that. Thank you. Oh, oh. and Yay. we're at the end yeah. for today. <laughs> There was one slide that got lost on Thursday. <laughs> we Save had um, at, just for council, we got through the night, but at, um, and Josh saw me at 525, saved my file and it said it was corrupt. <laughs> so. <laughs> Kudos to Josh. <laughs> <laughs> so we saw him, we said, and he, we were in a little bit of a panic at 525 today because we thought our file got corrupted. Up, so we weren't sure we have a presentation for tonight, so. A couple of things got lost when we were trying to recover our file. So this takes us all the way through the general fund. Like I say, said when we started the expenditures, really going all, go all the way back to the department. When we go back to this slide, again, they're really, you know, the majority of the departments, except for the things that we had a conversation about, there really is no change, nothing really unusual to talk about. Um, the departments are just sort of, you know, they know that they have to manage within that limited resources, and so they're just continuing to try and find efficiencies as best as they can. So there really isn't much else of a story to tell on the general fund. It's kind of an unusual year. Nina? Yeah. So again, I'm the new kid, and that's I'll ask okay. the obvious question: is, is this the part of the budget that's balanced? And how would I know that? It's balanced because if you look at this slide, it says our total general fund revenues without cash 
uh, expenditures is thirty-eight million seven seven two two nine zero. Can you go back to the? I'm hoping they're the same. Okay. <laughs> and if you look at that one, they don't match. So something happened along with you. Can, can I? Can I? Oh, the twenty-five thousand. Yes. That always happens. 25000 what we did was we used 25000 of 2014 money to refund the Historical Society's feasibility study. It's one-time money that was included as an appropriation in 2014. So I took 25000 out of cash to fund that project. Except, so I was, <laughs> I'm looking at uh, page 2-5 of the budget. And I look at, at the top, you've got general fund, uh, ending fund balance, and beginning fund balance, and the difference is not $25,000, it's only about $12,000. So, <laughs> which is fine. I mean, I, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it doesn't, it doesn't Remember, matter. we didn't have to use the full amount to cover, because we were able to build some yes, of it in. Yes, because we had savings. When, we, when you take revenues yeah. and expenditures... There is an 11,000 to the good for 2015. So instead of using the entire 25,000, I only had to use 13,000. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So if there are some takeaways from today, you know, I think what we were trying to say is one, the balance, the budget's balanced. Two, I think uh, the economy has changed that we've seen in terms of where our old growth model was and the taxes that we were relying upon. Um, it's, it's, we think it's going to be different going forward. Two, um, we've tried to, uh, in, in order to balance the budget, we've made some significant adjustments and reductions in our expenses as well as some adjustments in revenue. And it's primarily driven by new um, costs that have kind of come in from, you know, those sources that are kind of outside of our control, but they need to be built into the future uh, budget phase. That's pretty much. No, it's, that's pretty much it. Yes. Any other questions? I don't have a quote, oh, Josh. Well, I I guess I just have a process question because I I will have questions about the general fund and more particularly department level type questions or specific program type questions. So, process wise, I remember from last year we had a deadline for submitting those questions and then we would get certain responses back by another deadline and that enabled us as we move forward because our next meeting is scheduled for the 16th and I don't remember at this time of day what we're doing on the 16th but are we 14th. or 14th. 14th you're right 14th so um, that's even sooner so <laughs> what uh, what would be the timeline if we have questions coming out of tonight would you suggest, Paul or Stacy, that we wait to ask those until after that next meeting, or should we try to get them in before Friday, Friday which is coming up? If I had to answer questions, I would like them as soon as you could formulate them. And I don't know that there's a deadline for no more questions. We're going to be in dialogue for a couple weeks. And we would say the sooner we get those uh, questions in, the faster we can answer them. And if, if by your leave we could use a similar process that you just identified for Costco would be to share those questions out and we'll share the answers back. Um, but the only, the only concern we have kind of going forward is all the turnarounds on all of these meetings are pretty tight. So, um, you know, in the past we kind of had three or four days sometimes between some of these are like two-day turnarounds. So the more time we have to answer those, the better it is for us. In, in, in perhaps a procedural way, let's, you know, one single list and status. And, you know, we got to these three, but not to these other three. And at least we can see you're working on it. I mean, I would feel I, that's would be just, I think just knowing that you're still working on them is good. So... Um, Thank you for a very thorough uh, and I think very well laid out, uh, well communicated presentation. Um, as much as you might hope, I don't think you've eliminated the chance that we're not going to have a lot of fun. 
<laughs> but it's a pretty good first mm -hmm. first delivery. Thank you. Tola? Um, yeah. So it's been it's been a really really good conversation today, and and a lot of the um, concerns that I had with last year's budget are obviously the the process has has informed uh, what you guys brought here today. Um, uh, I, I don't feel any disconnect from like how at least I, as one of seven wanted to see this process go. Um, I do want to ask going forward: um, Is there going to be a point where we're going to talk about? I'm looking at back at page 2-5, the summary of expenditures and revenues by fund. At some point, not tonight, um, we go from, uh, you sum up all the funds, at the beginning of the year we're at $61 million and at the end of the year we're at $50 million. You did say this was a year that there's a lot, a lot of capital expenditures that are going to occur and I understand that's what capital funds are for, but I, I, it, sort, it sort of seems like in one of these four meetings we should probably go through this list a little bit and, and talk about you know, some of these are clearly um, the, the kinds of capital expenditures you were talking about and some of these look like maybe they're not. I have a slide for another for Tuesday night that shows the changes in what we're using, decreasing the funding balance. Excellent. Thank you. I just had an observation because uh, uh, to make when I was looking and trying to compare the expenditures and the revenues and fun seeing that it's balanced but there are uh, significantly higher increases in the expenditures than there are in the revenues. And if you just look at the percentages, you know, just these little percent changes along the general fund revenue, but it, uh, it works out because the 2014 budget had higher revenues than expenditures. So there was, there was room for the expenditures to be increased more. And, and the reason that I, I looked at that, and I just I just wanted to make a note of it because I want to come back and learn more about it on the expenditures. Though we say there aren't uh, many changes or anything to talk about, it seems like the um, the legal expenditure increase of 43 percent in the human services, though they are explained, they are significant. They're not an insignificant increase. It's a matter of opinion. Yeah. As a percent. Pardon me. As uh, a percent. Yeah. Yeah. We should let, let in, look. I, I thought the same thing. If we could, if we just saw the actual amount, because mm -hmm. you know when your basis is much lower. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, one percent in police is still a big number, and mm -hmm. six percent, whatever it is in fire, is a really big number. Yep. And forty-three percent in a smaller one is not a big number at all. Any council members have any more questions or comments? I, were there any outstanding questions? I don't believe so. All right, you get a free. Hello. Paul, I have that you asked for an electronic copy of the revenue history. You know, so I we'll checked my that. inbox and there it was. All right, very good. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, you can check it off. Excellent. like that. No, no, I had that you asked for the breakdown on sales tax sources, retail, construction, et cetera. So we'll provide that. I think Diane said she has that. Um, Jen said that she would provide the uh, B&O outreach schedule to you, so we will do that. Uh, and Joshua had asked if we were considering extending reciprocity to any other cities. Um, I didn't sense that there was any need for follow-up on that, that you, you got the answer to that question. Is that correct? Did, did I get the answer? Did you get the answer? I, I, my I saw Anne nod her head and said that was an interesting thought and Parks and Rec might think about it. I don't, okay. I guess that was an answer. Okay. All right. <laughs> that was yeah, she said, yes, they could <laughs> do that. <laughs> All right. Okay. And then... Tola, you just asked a question that I think Diane answered by saying that she was going to provide that um, other funds history and, and balances in a future meeting. So that's all I have. Thank you. Really, thank you. Yeah, that's good. 
I guess we're done. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>